Hello students, welcome to unit 3.4. Uh, for this unit, we are going to be studying and analyzing the brain. Alright, remember, the main theme for all of unit 3 are parts and functions. So make sure you memorize all the parts of the brain and the specific function of those parts. Okay, so let's continue. Alright, before we begin getting into all the scientific... Uh, analysis and before we diving before we start diving in into too much depth uh, into the uh, intricacies of the brain let's first have a little fun let's look at a man's brain a woman's brain and a dog's brain and let's see if you can tell the difference so here's a man's brain you might want to pause and so you have a pause the video so you have time to look it over and, and have a nice little giggle and to see if you can tell the difference between the man's brain and the woman's brain here's the woman's brain Notice that the sex region in the man's brain is much larger than that of the female. Uh, also, compassion, uh, jealousy, and other commitment regions of the brain are much larger in the female than in the male. Of course, this is all just a big joke and isn't actually true. And here, just for fun, is a dog's brain. Notice the enlarged uh, frisbee gland. Obviously, this is my dog. All right? Most dogs don't have as large of a frisbee gland, but you know, this is my dog, of course. And, of course, they have the chasing cortex. They chase bikes, they chase balls, they chase cars, and they chase cats. And, of course, this is all, again, not accurate. This is just having fun. All right, class. So, as you can see, <laughs> the next few images are going to be a little graphic. Um, this is the bird's eye view of the human brain. And it probably doesn't look like what your typical brain would look like because that is it's, it's surrounded in what's called cere uh, cerebral dura matter which encloses the brain, and as you can see from the picture, it's been detached carefully from the internal surfaces of the cranial bones. So that's why it looks veiny and gray and, and kind of rough. Here's the same image, but from the left side of the person's face, so if it's like you're looking at the left side of their face, um, or the left temporal lobe, which is the side of the brain we're looking at. Uh, here again, you can see the dura mater that encloses the brain. Uh, this has several uh, primary... Uh, purposes. It's, it encloses the brain to protect it. It provides a protective layer and uh, it also provides it with nutrients and blood and oxygen and all that good stuff that our brain needs to be healthy and, and function properly. So here we see an image of the dura mater as it encloses the brain inside the skull. Uh, so we can see here how it can provide a protective barrier and a protective layer for the brain. All right. So, um, now let's begin to really talk about and get into the parts and, and details of the brain. All right, students, we're about to begin to, to discuss all the parts and functions of the brain. Uh, so first we're going to begin with the three regions of the brain. <clears throat> the three regions are the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. The forebrain is the uh, most recently developed portion of our brain that we have. It's really what cr sets us apart as humans from other species. This is what gives us higher uh, cognitive functions and higher uh, skills in mental processing. Um, and we'll d discuss that further. The midbrain contains the upper part of the brain stem. All right, this includes the limbic system and the, and the thalamus, and we'll go into that in more detail later on. And the hindbrain, this is the, this is the portion of the brain that we have in common with most all other species on this planet. It's the portion of the brain that connects with the spinal cord and maintains all of the life-sustaining functions, as we will go into further detail. So as stated on the previous slide, the hindbrain is the portion of the brain that we have in common with a lot of species on this planet. It's a portion of the brain that enables, that, that, that provides us life-sustaining involuntary functions. We do not voluntarily control uh, the functions of the hindbrain. Now, it's really important to note that the hindbrain is more commonly known as the brainstem. Um, it will be referred to as the brainstem from here on out. So on the AP exam, on our exam in, in class, and in other academic articles and journals, it is referred to as the brainstem. Okay? So now let's begin to talk about the parts of the brainstem that you need to be familiar with, as well as their functions. So we're going to begin that discussion with the medulla. Now, I'm sure you've heard of this portion of the brain in the famous movie Waterboy starring Adam Sandler, uh, where Colonel Sanders, one of his college professors, talks about the medulla oblongata, uh, 
that's this, but it's not entirely accurate uh, how they portray it in the movie. The medulla is a part of the brain stem which attaches to the spinal cord and is responsible for maintaining our heartbeat and our respiratory rate. All right, this is very important for sustaining life, obviously. Okay? The, another portion of the brain that you need to be familiar with is the pons. And as you can see in the image, the pons is located right there in the brainstem. The pons is responsible for relaying information from the cerebellum here. Uh, there, here's the cerebellum. It relays information from the cerebellum to the pons and up to the cerebrum, which is the rest uh, of the brain. This the four lobes of the brain that we'll go into detail uh, later on. Okay, so pons relays information from cerebellum to cerebrum. And remember, the cerebellum coordinates muscle movements. The cerebellum has other functions that we'll discuss in class. The last part of the brainstem that we will discuss will be the reticular formation. The reticular formation is a nerve network that runs throughout the brainstem from top to bottom that plays an important role in controlling arousal and sleep. All right, so you know if your teacher is really boring in class and you start to doze off or your eyes start to close and you start to drift away into sleep, the reason that is is because your reticular formation is not sufficiently aroused. And as a result, it begins to cut off, uh, cut off energy to your brain, causing you to fall asleep. All right? The reticular formation is also involved in controlling muscle reflexes, breathing, and perception. So very important to life-sustaining functions, All right, keeping us awake, that is. All right, here in this image, we can see all the main parts that we've discussed. Um, here is the medulla. All right, it controls, uh, facilitates heart beating and breathing. Okay, and here is the pons, which relays information from the cerebellum to the cerebrum. All right. And then, wait, what's the cere cerebellum thing? We haven't talked about that. We'll get to that soon. And here's the hindbrain again. <clears throat> All right, here we see the medulla, reticular formation, and can you spot the pons? The pons is right there. All right. Okay, it's important to note that while the cerebellum is considered in the hindbrain region, the cerebellum itself is not a part of the brainstem. All right, the cerebellum may be attached to the brainstem, but it's not a part of the brainstem. So it's important to make that distinction. Okay, so what is the cerebellum and what does it do? The cerebellum is the very small brain-like looking structure on the back lower part of the rest of your brain called the cerebrum. The cerebellum, and for that reason, the cerebellum is called the little brain. All right, this part of the brain helps coordinate voluntary muscle movement and balance. All right, so it's responsible for our vestibular sense, which is our sense of balance. And again, it coordinates muscle movements. So if you're walking a tightrope wire or if you're running sprints, you're, you need to have your cerebellum activated so you, can, uh, so you can use those muscles and coordinate those movements. So here in this image, we see the cerebellum. It's the very small brain uh, attached to the brainstem there. And in this image below, you can see several parts that we've discussed. So why don't you pause the video, what, look at those parts carefully, and try to remember to yourself, without looking at your notes, what their functions are. This will help you memorize their functions. The next part of the brain that we'll, that we'll discuss is the midbrain. Now the midbrain uh, is a segment of the brainstem uh, located at the top of the brainstem, just between the hindbrain and the forebrain. Okay, you can forget this part because I don't, uh, shouldn't have put that there. Okay, the midbrain consists or com is comprised of the tectum and the temectum. All right, the tectum is reflex movement in the head and eye. So if, you, if, if something's coming at you and you, by reflex, jerk your head to see it, um, or your eyes look at a fly that just flies in front of your face, it's a reflex and that's, res and that's the tectum that's responsible for that. The temectum is the brain's floor. Not much is known about it. Moving on. The next part is the forebrain. And in the forebrain, we will focus on the limbic system. 
The forebrain is the middle, the interior, the middle interior portion of the brain that we better know as the limbic system. So from now on, we're calling it the limbic system. The limbic system is a donut-shaped system of neural structures at the border of the brain stem and the cerebral hemispheres, which we'll talk about next. It's associated with emotions such as fear and aggression and drives such as for food, sex, and it regulates emotions, memory, and motivations. It includes the hippocampus, <clears throat> includes the hippocampus, the amygdala, the thalamus, the pituitary gland, and the hypothalamus which we will now discuss. The thalamus, as we can see pointed at from the arrow, sits at the top of the brainstem, and this is referred to as the brain's sensory switchboard because all of our senses, except for smell, must first be processed by the thalamus before they can be redirected to the appropriate portions of the brain. And we'll talk about why not smell in class, so don't let me forget. Okay? The amygdala... Better know you might it might be easier to call it Amy Gadala, or it might be better easier to spell it Amy Gadala, but it's pronounced amygdala. And these are the two almond-shaped neural clusters that you can see here that are components of the limbic system and are linked to our emotions, such as aggression and fear. So the amygdala portion of the brain is what processes our emotions. The hypothalamus is another very important part of the limbic system and as you can see from the image it is located in the interior portion of the brain just on the upper left side of the brain stem. The hypothalamus are, is a neural structure lying below the thalamus meaning hypo under the thalamus. It directs several maintenance activities such as eating, drinking and, our body, and it regulates our body temperature so your sense of hunger starts with the hypothalamus portion of your brain. It, helps govern, it also helps govern our hormones via the endocrine system. It, it manipulates the pituitary gland, which we'll talk about further in class. It is also linked with emotions as it is close to the amygdala. Remember the five F's for the hypothalamus. It regulates our fight or flight response, so it kicks in our uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So fight or flight are two F's. Fahrenheit is the third to remember that it regulates our body temperature. Fornication, because it also regulates our sex drive. And then food, because it regulates our sense of hunger. When we feel hungry or when we feel full, that is our hypothalamus um, impacting our perception. The hippocampus is two little pea pods uh, looking structures that are, on both, that are found in both hemispheres of the brain. All right. It literally means in Latin "sea monster," because I don't know. It kind of looks like one, I guess. Uh, but humans and other mammals have two hippocampi, one in each side of the brain, in which we call hemispheres. This plays an important role in the consolidation of information from short-term memory to long-term memory, and for spatial navigation. What you need to be aware of is that the hippocampus is vital to our long-term memory. Hippocampus, long-term memory. So here in this image, we see everything we just discussed except for the thalamus. But remember, the thalamus sits at the top of the brainstem and is, con and is called the sensory switchboard because it directs all our senses except for smell to the appropriate portions of the brain. And then we have the hypothalamus, which is the five Fs, fight, flight, Fahrenheit, food, and fornication. Okay, remember those five Fs because those are all the functions of the hypothalamus. And then, as we learned from last unit in the endocrine system, we have the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is the master gland because no other gland in our body can excrete a hormone unless first instructed to by the pituitary gland. And then next we discussed the amygdala. This is the emotions warehouse of our brain. This is where all of our emotions come from. And then there is the hippocampus. We talked about how the hippocampus stores all of our long-term memories. And here we see several of those parts again. We see the amygdala, we see the reticular formation that we discussed in the brainstem, the hippocampus, there's the thalamus, the sensory switchboard, the hypothalamus, which is the five Fs, um, and then the 
Okay, well, I guess that's it. Well, what's the frontal lobe? What's the olfactory lobe? What is the cingulate gyrus? What are these things? Well, let's discuss it. All right, next we will discuss the brain, the portion of the brain that most of us are familiar with. This is the cerebrum. It's the largest and most complex part of the human brain. It includes the brain areas that are responsible for the most complex mental activities, such as learning, remembering, thinking, and consciousness itself, all come from the cerebrum. The most significant part of the cerebrum is the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is the convoluted outer layer of the cerebrum. It's, so it's a, it's a layer that wraps around the cerebrum. All right, it's the, cor the cortex itself is folded and bent and divided into two hemispheres. The hemispheres are the left and right halves of the cerebrum. The intricate fabric of interconnected neural cells that covers the cerebral hemispheres. It's also the body's ultimate control and information processing center. All right, so let's discuss the four main parts of the cerebrum and the cerebral cortex. The first part that we will discuss is the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe is located here in blue, or in light blue. It receives sensory information from our body. It's involved in spatial abilities. So when we touch a desk, or if we feel a cloth, or anything we touch and feel, that information is processed by the sensory cortex of the parietal lobe. Next, we'll discuss the frontal lobe. All right. The frontal lobe is responsible with coordinating information from other lobes. The frontal lobe is where our higher association areas for critical thinking and uh, moral judging, and it's our moral compass, if you will. It, it's also responsible for controlling our voluntary movements. All right. So when you move your arms to pick up a pencil, you are using your front, you're using your frontal lobe. It's also involved in our int uh, attention. It's involved in setting goals and expression of appropriate emotions. The other two lobes of the cerebral cortex are the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is found in the back rear portion of the brain. It's in green. The occipital lobe is where the visual cortex is located and it receives and processes visual information. So when you look at something and you see something, that information, that visual sensory information is being processed in the back of your brain. The last lobe of the cerebral cortex is the temporal lobe, and that is highlighted here in purple. It is the complex visual tasks such as face recognition. So when you see someone's face and you remember their face, the rear portion of the temporal lobe where it connects with the occipital lobe is responsible for that facial recognition. But more importantly, the temporal lobe processes auditory information. So when you hear things and process sound and words that are pe people are telling you, that is your temporal lobe. All right? It's also involved somewhat in balance with your vestibular sense, and it's involved with language processing in an area called Wernicke's area, which we'll talk about later. So here we see the four lobes we just discussed in the cerebral cortex. The frontal lobe, which is our moral compass, and also enables us to move our, move our limbs and move our body. And then there's the parietal lobe, which is our sensory cortex. And then the occipital lobe, which is our visual cortex. And the temporal lobe, which is our auditory cortex. Now there's a very special part of your brain that is called the motosensory cortex. That is to say, it's the motosensory cortex. This is the portion of the brain where the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe meet. Because the frontal lobe is responsible for our muscle movements, and the parietal lobe is responsible for our sensory uh, inputs, this, when they touch, when they meet, that has very significant consequences. That's how we are able to feel something and react to it very quickly. All right? As you can see from our motor cortex, there are specific parts of this strip in the brain that we know for a fact control certain parts of the body, as we see in this diagram. And there are certain specific parts of the sensory cortex that enable us to feel 
certain parts of the body, and we know exactly where these parts are due to recent technological innovations. See, I told you guys, this field is growing right now. So real quickly, to recap what we just discussed, the motor cortex is the area of the rear part of the frontal lobe that controls our voluntary movements. The sensory cortex is in the front part of the parietal lobe that registers and processes our, all of our body sensations. Except for what? That's right, the reflex pathways. Association areas, or higher association areas, or are the areas of the brain found all along the, the layer of the cerebral cortex that makes us human and makes us who we are. These association areas function to produce a meaningful, perceptual, uh, a meaningful perceptual experience of the world. It enables us to interact effectively and support abstract thinking and language. You see, here, you see here how in the brain there are fissures and dents and curves? The more of those you have, the better. Because that means you have more space and you have more neural uh, networks within your cerebral cortex and the higher association areas. So you're going to have better skills at abstract reasoning, at critical thinking, um, and all, all the above. Now we have two hemispheres of the brain. And it's important to note that the left hemisphere manipulates the right side of our body, whereas the right hemisphere manipulates the left side of our body, as you can see from this image. All right. So if we have two, if we have two separate halves of our brain, how do they communicate to one another? Well, they utilize a portion of the brain called the corpus callosum, as you can see right here. The corpus callosum is a is a strand of neural fibers that connect the two hemispheres. It allows close communication between the left and right hemisphere. So each hemisphere appears to specialize in certain. So while each hemisphere appears to specialize in certain functions, the notion that someone is either left-brained or either right-brained is completely false, because the hemispheres communicate to one another via the corpus callosum. Here we see a picture of the corpus callosum inside the brain. So here's the corpus callosum. If you took a brain from the bird's eye view and you cut it down the middle and pulled it apart, you'd see the corpus callosum connecting the two hemispheres in the uh, lower middle portion of the brain, the interior portion as well. Yeah. In this image is most of the information, most of the parts and functions of the brain that we've discussed so far. Please pause the video and look over this slide and try to contemplate and memorize the parts and the, infra and the functions of those parts. So back to the hemispheres. The way your brain is organized is fairly interesting. The right side of your brain does seem to process more emotional expression, spatial awareness. It also is involved in music, musical understanding, creativity, um, where the left, portion, left hemisphere of the brain tends to be more linear thinking, all right, like writing, language skills, scientific skills, mathematics, and logistics. However, remember, the corpus callosum connects both of these sides, so they work in harmony with one another. Pause this and look at it for a few minutes. We'll talk about it more in class. All right, so as you can see, not only does the left hemisphere control the right side of our body and the right hemisphere control the left side of our body, all right, but it also crisscrosses at the corpus callosum and the thalamus um, for our visual, visual sensory inputs as well. So as you can see, <clears throat> the right side, or the, the right eye here, will crisscross its frontal view over to the left hemisphere, whereas the left eye will crisscross its frontal view over to the right hemisphere. Okay, so in review, we see the visual cortex in the occipital lobe and the auditory cortex in the temporal lobe. Note that these cortexes do not take up the entire lobe. The reason is, those lobes have other functions. Some we know about, others we don't know about. Several key terms to note. Aphasia. Aphasia refers to the impairment of language, usually caused by left hemisphere damage either to Broca's area, impairing speaking, or to Wernicke's area, impairing understanding. Broca's area is found in the left hemisphere in the frontal lobe of the brain. And this is what enables us to speak. So when you open your mouth and speak, you are utilizing Broca's area. Wernicke's area is the area in the left hemisphere in the temporal lobe 
that is involved in language comprehension. Not only does Wernicke's area enable us to process spoken language, but it also enables us to process and understand written language. So you can see how the visual cortex of the occipital lobe and the auditory cortex of the temporal lobe are somewhat interconnected and share certain functions. Here we see that explained in a graph. We see Broca's area in the frontal lobe of the left hemisphere, which controls speech muscles. And then here we see Wernicke's area, which processes spoken as well as written speech. And as we can see from the graph, the angular gyrus is involved in visual representations of auditory code. So when we read something and put an image in our head, that is the angular gyrus. We see that explained using uh, brain imaging technologies, which we'll talk about next unit. The association areas, or the higher association areas that we discussed earlier, remember, these are the areas that do not have a committed purpose. The sensory cortex of the parietal lobe, the motor cortex of the frontal lobe, the auditory cortex of the temporal lobe, and the visual cortex of the occipital lobe are, have specific functions to process those sensory informations. However, there's a large portion of the cerebral cortex that is comprised of association areas. Again, these association areas are, have non or uncommitted uh, tasks, that meaning they can do whatever you need them to, to do, like critical thinking, problem solving, abstract reasoning, creativity, all comes from these higher association areas. And as you notice, rats don't really have high association areas. Cats have very little. Chimpanzees have a great deal of association areas in comparison to cats, but look at the human brain. Our brain has way more asso higher association areas than other species, and this is what separates us from other species because these higher association areas en enable us to have critical thinking skills and abstract reasoning and creativity. Brain plasticity we might have mentioned or alluded to in class once or twice, but it's where your brain can modify itself. So if you have brain trauma or if you damage one portion of the brain, there are other portions of the brain in the higher association areas that we've discussed that can take on those tasks. So that's how people who have strokes can learn to walk again because those association areas can learn or adapt to develop new tasks that other portions of the brain uh, may have lost or atrophied. Don't forget the corpus callosum. It's the large band of neural fibers that connects the two hemispheres. It carries messages between the two hemispheres. Don't forget. Now, one dangerous thing with the corpus callosum is that sometimes when our neurons fire, they can fire very rapidly and very randomly across the corpus callosum. When that, when that happens at an abnormal rate, it can cause seizures. So what people do to prevent this is they sever the corpus callosum. They completely cut it uh, in half, right down the middle, so that your two hemispheres are now separated from one another. And this could have some very interesting consequences. And we'll watch a video on that in class. Don't let me forget. And here we see a, a scan of that. We see the electrical charges crisscrossing across the uh, corpus callosum. Now when it's severed, the corpus callosum that is, you can see that there's no more, uh, no more random neural firing. So the seizures have been fixed. All right, that's it for Unit 3.4. See you guys in class.